The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, there were a couple of high-profile meetings this week that caught our attention, uh, particularly in Senegal. And that's not a part of the world that we talk about that much, not enough, and something that we're going to focus on a lot more in the coming years, not just because in 2021, uh, the next Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit, the big FOCAC get-together that happens every three, three years, will happen in Dakar, but also because of the growing presence of the Chinese in uh, Francophone Africa and in West Africa in particular. So the two events that I talked about, number one last week, there was a uh, first ever Sino-Senegalese cooperation forum that uh, focused on developing closer trade and investment in infrastructure ties between the two countries. That was the first time that those two had come together to really talk about bringing the the force of the China Exim Bank, the development, the infrastructure that we've seen in other parts of Africa now are finally making their way into places like Senegal. Then in Paris, a two-day get-together at the Ministry of Finance at Bercy uh, called Africa Ambition. Now, this was very interesting because this was when French business leaders and African business leaders, predominantly from Francophone countries, came together in an effort to try and jumpstart uh, French economic engagement in, that, in, in Africa. It was interesting because my old uh, co- colleagues at Radio France International wrote a very, very cynical, skeptical piece about the French in, in Africa, saying that the Chinese have basically narrowed in what they can do. Many of the industries that the French used to dominate in infrastructure, telecommunications, and power are now basically the domain of the Chinese. So, Cobus, a real interesting turn of events over the past, say, 15, 20 years, we would not have thought that the French would be the underdogs in West Africa. Very much not. This is this is a really interesting development. And over the last few years, we've always heard the this idea that, that China is a lot more prominent in Anglophone Africa, um, and, th- and th- thanks to the influence of Macau, also in Portuguese-speaking Africa, but not very dominant in French-speaking Africa, and be- because of the established historical ties with France. And I mean, those ties are still, are still relatively strong. You know, uh, France still takes more African foreign students, for example, than any other place, but China is number two. Um, so, you know, oh, this, this has been a kind of a, an established idea that, you know, that, that France's influence in West Africa remains very strong and that it, it makes it difficult for China to operate there. Now this seems to be changing and it, 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 it then raises a lot of questions about France's role in Africa as a whole, you know, kind of what West Africa is going to be like and how things will shift in West Africa, you know, as more Chinese companies move in. Well, let's get a perspective from Senegal, and we're going to go to Dakar now, where we're thrilled to have on the program for the first time Professor Amadou Alimbay, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institute in Washington, where he and I enjoyed a lovely lunch earlier this summer in D.C. Uh, but now he's back in Dakar, where he's a professor of economics at the University of Sheikh Anta Diop in Dakar. Uh, a very good afternoon to you, uh, Ali. Uh, Good afternoon to you, Eric. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and really, again, bring the issue of Senegal's burgeoning relationship with with China and also its relationship with some of the other major players in the world. Uh, Senegal has has a little bit of a problem when it comes to China. It's the same problem that most African countries have. Um, Senegal imports about $896 million worth of goods from China, but exports just about $115 million in return. Massive trade imbalance. There doesn't seem to be a pathway to reconcile those trade imbalances. Uh, So talk to us a little bit about the health, in your view, when you look at Senegal's relationship with a country like China, and how sustainable do you think it is when, in fact, there are these very, very big gaps in in how they trade with one another. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is a very good point. Uh, What we are seeing uh, for the uh, last couple of decades, uh, 
is that uh, Senegal's partnership with France is being challenged with, by its partnership is with China. Uh, France used to be uh, our major trade partner. Uh, we were exporting the bulk of our uh, output to France, and uh, most of our imports were also from France. But now these uh, trends are completely changing, and uh, China is becoming uh, our biggest trade partner. And also in terms of investment, uh, we observe the same. Before, most uh, foreign direct investment uh, flowing into Senegal uh, used to come from France. But increasingly, we observe that uh, China is taking over also uh, uh, in this respect. Uh, so uh, it's what you observe in other African countries. Uh, the only caveat, though, is that uh, most of what African countries uh, are exporting to China uh, is basically uh, commodities, either uh, mineral items or agricultural products and the like. And most of uh, imports uh, from China into Africa uh, uh, are mainly manufacturing and other, other, other items. So this is uh, very much related uh, to the uh, structure uh, of uh, African economies, uh, which are mostly uh, commodity-based economies. Uh, so Africa is producing and exporting worldwide uh, commodities and uh, importing uh, manufacturing. So uh, in this regard, the relationship to China uh, is no exception uh, with respect to uh, what we observe uh, also vis-à-vis -vis other countries. Can you unpack this this double dynamic a little bit? Has so in the first place, has the relationship with France actively declined, um, or has it was it essentially stagnant and then face suddenly face new challenges from China? And then also on the Chinese side, have we seen like a, you know a, a rapid kind of broadening of engagement across different sectors, or or are the, the, is the Chinese engagement really f um, focused within a few small or or narrow sectors? Look, uh, first about France. I think France, like Senegal, uh, but not uh, uh, to the same extent, uh, is facing very serious economic challenges. Uh, its competitiveness is eroding, and its uh, economic and political influence worldwide is shrinking. Uh, and of course, it's normal that uh, the dynamics I described earlier uh, be observed. I mean, or, or French, France losing ground in Africa in general, in Senegal in particular. And uh, yeah, so this is the, the, the main observation I, want, I wanted to, to, to make about France. But now, coming back to China, I think uh, uh, being in interaction with many Chinese colleagues and visiting China uh, rather often, uh, what I can see is that China is trying to diversify its partnership with Africa. What we observed in the last couple of decades is that China uh, has been busy uh, importing uh, mineral products from Africa, building uh, bridges and roads, uh, being involved in telecom, uh, yes, and uh, exporting a lot of manufacturing to Africa. But what we observe recently is that China uh, is trying to relocate some of its enterprises uh, into Africa because they are realizing that uh, labor costs are increasing uh, very fast in China, which is normal. Uh, as you might know, manufacturing is, uh, I mean, you can develop competitiveness in manufacturing only when you are, I mean, relatively poor and labor intensive uh, country. Uh, with cheaper labor. So as China grows, uh, we can see that uh, labor is no longer being cheap. So China is trying to relocate some of its enterprises outside China, and Africa is a main, uh, I mean, is becoming a main target for China. Uh, 
But what we observe is that the business environment in Africa is such that uh, such, relocating, uh, such, such relocation uh, doesn't follow the same trends and patterns as elsewhere in the developing world. But uh, now there is no doubt that China is trying uh, to diversify a type of partnership it has been uh, developing with Africa away from uh, infrastructure uh, and also uh, importing mineral and agricultural uh, 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 outputs, I mean uh, products, uh, to try to set up firms in Africa. But uh, uh, progress so far uh, has been very limited. That was on full display uh, last week at the Sino-Senegalese summit, or it wasn't a summit, it was a kind of a get-together of business leaders, and they brought over uh, people from the China Exim Bank, they brought over corporate leaders and whatnot, and it really gave the indication, and this was a CGTN, so it was a piece of propaganda video, so it's hard to tell what was what, but that being said, at least from the video, it was apparent that there is a growing interest in China for Senegal, and China is late coming to West Africa and French-speaking West Africa, but it does seem like we're starting to see a lot more inroads, not just in Senegal, but also in Gabon uh, and, uh, and other French-speaking countries. So the Chinese are ready to engage Senegal. I guess my question for you is when you talk to Senegalese leaders, Senegalese academics and other stakeholders, are they ready to engage the Chinese? And what that means is for most of your, the modern history, Senegal has been oriented towards Paris. And the language is common. The culture is well known. Many Senegalese elites have been educated in France. So there's a familiarity and an understanding of how to do business and how to do deals with the French. That really isn't there with the Chinese. So talk to us a little bit about how prepared you think that Senegal is now to deal with this new arrival of the Chinese interest. Look, uh, first, with respect to France again, uh, you have to make a difference between the political relationship and the social and cultural relationship. Uh, the paradox in France and Africa relationship is that uh, most people uh, who were educated, most Africans who were educated in France, uh, paradoxically uh, are quite resentful to France. There is something wrong that will need to be fixed. Uh, people find France very very arrogant and uh, 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 usually what we see as a French, uh, France Afrique, we call it in French, France Afrique, which is a, a network of businesses, of businessmen and politicians in Africa and France, which are seen as conspiring against Africa and even against French people. So this is doing a lot of, a lot of harm to French and African relationship. Uh, most of African elites, intellectual elites, uh, develop a kind of resentment. If you see this debate about the, the current debate about the CFA, uh, it's much more about emotion uh, than about facts. But because people are very, very resentful uh, to our friends. So can, I'm sorry, before we go on much further, can you explain the CFA? Because it's a concept that I think is not very well understood outside of West Africa. Well, the CFA uh, is very simple. Uh, about, it is about a, a common currency, uh, a currency which is common to eight African countries in West Africa and a set of African countries in Central Africa. So we have two different CFAs, even though people tend to make the confusion, tending to, uh, I mean, uh, confuse both CFAs, but we have two different CFAs. And the problem is that uh, each of these currencies is uh, guaranteed uh, 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 by France and pegged to the euro. Previously, uh, they were pegged to uh, the French franc. Okay? And, yeah, uh, you find many similar arrangements worldwide. Uh, but again, because of this France-Afrique issue, I mean, all these uh, 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 network, uh, very opaque, 
network of businessmen and politicians in Africa and France uh, controlling the bulk of resources in Africa. So this brings about a lot of resentment uh, of African elites vis-à-vis uh, -vis France. And uh, people who studied in France also uh, usually come back uh, with a very uh, nasty feeling about France because usually they, 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 they felt they was, uh, they feel they were uh, segregated uh, and things like that while in France. So you have a lot of examples one big example uh, being the case of the Cameroonian singer uh, uh, Richard Bono. I'm sure you know him. So, and you also have this uh, uh, Malian, uh, very uh, uh, big, I mean, I mean, high-profile expert uh, who used to work with NASA and who was a fam former prime minister of Mali, uh, Modi Bojara. Uh, he had uh, expressed, this, I mean, similar uh, feelings about France, and this is widespread in Francophone Africa. So, these, uh, I mean, resentment of African elites toward France is not making no good uh, of the prospect uh, to the prospect of the relationship between Africa and France. So now coming back to China, uh, yeah, I, I, I confirm you that they are they are making an important move uh, uh, towards I mean developing businesses uh, in Senegal. But uh, you have to understand that the business environment in Francophone Africa uh, in Senegal in, in particular. Uh, is not very conducive uh, to uh, uh, making businesses flourish. Uh, so the government is very, uh, I, I mean, is, is making voluntary move uh, to facilitate these uh, uh, Chinese uh, 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 businesses arrival in Senegal, but uh, is still very, 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 very uh, limited. For example, we have a Chinese garment industry uh, actually uh, operating in Senegal, but uh, the Senegalese government is uh, making a lot of efforts in terms of subsidizing some of the labor uh, to keep the business running. So we need to uh, have a serious business model allowing uh, private uh, uh, businesses to operate uh, in a normal way. Uh, but uh, not through uh, subsidies uh, similar to what we have, for example, in uh, the uh, 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 tiny number of firms, uh, Chinese firms, uh, which are not, I mean, private Chinese firms operating in Senegal. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at WitsChinaAfrica or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Um, over the last year or so, we've, we've heard a lot of discussion in forums like the OECD and the G20 about the need to build more public-private partnerships. And European countries, Germany in particular, but France also, have really pushed this kind of this idea that they want to kind of matchmake between between African countries and European businesses in order to set up, you know, more more business to kickstart development in parts of Africa, and then also, you know, as as you know, uh, as part of that, to try and and stem the tide of of African migrants moving to Europe. Um, so the idea is, you know, obviously creating creating uh, more jobs on the African continent, and which would which would lessen the incentive to to move to Europe. Um, you know, so I've been in meetings where, where you know, French development um, uh, researchers and so on have, 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 have talked about how much energy and money the, Fr the French government is putting into this, this kind of business development. Do you see that actually happening on the ground? Are these, these European initiatives actually changing anything on the ground? I think not yet, but they're working on it. So uh, we still have some challenges. One challenge is labor. Uh, a big paradox about Africa is that it is labor abundant. You have a lot of people uh, who are easy unemployed or underemployed, but uh, labor is no cheap. If you look at labor costs, it tends to be higher in Africa than in all the developing world. So this is a very big challenge. And it's very hard to change because of the strengths 
of his of unions especially in francophone africa unions are very 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 strong in our rankings of uh, labor rigidity worldwide uh, for example senegal uh, was ranked 187 out of 189 so this is this is a clear indication that labor market is not functioning well okay in 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 in, in africa in general in francophone africa in particular this is one also most infrastructure services are failing and this is a very big impediment uh, to growth and enterprise development okay financing is a big issue okay you have several uh, hurdles like that uh, deterring uh, private investment into Africa. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, these cannot be lifted. So if we have a very strong uh, will at the government's level and a strong partnership from Europe or from China, yeah, we could uh, 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 go around these hurdles like the example of Ethiopia uh, shows, but it will need uh, some work to be, to be, to be done. Senegal is rather late to the game in terms of engaging the Chinese. So again, what we've talked about, the Chinese have been mostly in Anglophone, Lusophone, and even Arabic Africa before they've come into Francophone Africa. Uh, in part because, as you talked about, there's very strict labor issues, but also the legal systems tend to favor the French over others because they wrote the codes in many respects. So it's just been, there's been a lot more barriers to entry, but those are starting to come down now. The French are starting to to, to kind of withdraw because they just can't compete the way they used to. Um, so the fact that you're late to the game in some ways may be a good thing because you can look at the experience of other African countries who have struggled with the Chinese to some extent. Certainly we've seen that in Zambia, in Kenya, even Nigeria to some extent in terms of excessive lending, also labor issues, cultural issues. What are the lessons that you think when you look at the rest of the continent that you can bring to Senegal in terms of how to engage the Chinese in a more productive way? What do you think some lessons that Senegalese leaders might be taking away from that experience? Yeah, I think the lesson we can draw uh, from Chinese relationship to other, I mean, African and developing countries is that vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, uh, like vis-a-vis -vis other countries, what African countries need to develop is a very clear strategy. What you observe in most African countries is that you are having policy being designed and implemented without no clear strategy behind. Uh, and that is the, 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 the biggest challenge uh, African policymakers we need to address in the, in the near future. Uh, if they want to uh, take profit uh, of the relationship uh, to China, but also to other, uh, I mean, uh, countries, you don't have a very clear strategy uh, shaping uh, African policy and African also relationship uh, to other countries. So that's why uh, uh, you're having all these uh, f f uh, negative trends uh, in African economies. What we lack is very, a very clear strategy, well thought strategy, including partnership vis-a-vis -vis China and vis-a-vis -vis others. How, how, if you could, if you could advise African leaders. Um, what kind of strategy would you suggest uh, in relation to China? Particularly, maybe we could narrow it down to, to trade. You know, kind of as you mentioned, the, the trade imbalance between Africa and China is, is stuck. Um, Africa tends to be locked into, into exporting raw commodities and importing finished products. Um, but at the same time, if, you know, Africa is moving, you know, they, 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 they kicked off the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the, the first African country to, to sign a free trade agreement with China recently was Mauritius. Um, how would you advise African leaders to, to maximize trade with China while, you know, not falling into any of these, these traps, including, you know, kind of the, the, the danger of, of, of the, the free trade, the continental free trade agreement leading to just lots and lots of, of very cheap Chinese products kind of washing into the continent? Yeah, uh, again, the overarching argument I would make is again to have to develop 
a very clear and effective, I mean, result-based strategy. You can see that uh, you are moving from one summit to another. Russia, Africa, France, Africa, China, Africa, US, Africa, and all these countries or regions uh, are just trying uh, to implement a very well thought strategy of which relationship to Africa is just one component. I'm just uh, taking the example of the Chinese uh, uh, Belt Road, okay? Uh, yeah, but what is Africa's strategy when engaging with these big countries? So you, 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 you cannot see any patterns emerging uh, with respect to such strategy. So this is critical uh, for Africa to take any profit uh, of its partnership uh, with China, but also with other countries. So uh, to me, this is, this, is, this, is, this is very important. Now, to me, the, the mechanics of economic development is much better now, uh, now, now than before. Uh, we pretty much understand how we can jumpstart an economy. Uh, if you look at uh, the trajectory of most uh, European and Asian countries, you can see that the pattern is the same. Usually, uh, poor countries tend to have a comparative advantage in manufacturing. So it was the case uh, for Europe, it was the case for the US, uh, it used to be the case for China and then increasingly so for all the Asian countries like Cambodia, Bangladesh and the like. Okay, the, the poorer you are, uh, the greater your comparative advantage in traditional manufacturing. And again, uh, Africa is poor, but they are struggling to build a strong comparative advantage in manufacturing because costs are high in Africa than elsewhere. So, uh, working uh, with other partners like China, Europe, uh, or the US uh, to bring down this cost in order to uh, bring in investment, to me, would be the right way to go. And again, China is pretty much looking for that. Uh, again, I have a lot of uh, engagement with uh, China's partners in academia in, in uh, other spheres. And um, I can tell you, they are looking for that, relocating firms. And we need to work with them. And I, I can see that all the European countries, uh, as you mentioned, uh, are, are, are trying to, to, to use the same path. Germany is developing a compact with uh, selected African countries, uh, among which Senegal is part. And I think uh, this is the right uh, move to have. But again, uh, this will need to be uh, the, the, the product of joint strategies. While for now, my feeling is that uh, they are just translation of uh, strategies from Europe, strategies from China, from the US. You, you cannot find the, 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 uh, the similar uh, move in Africa. So we need to have uh, a, a very clear strategy in order to engage with these countries and uh, work with them in uh, uh, bringing costs down, uh, making business uh, easier in Africa, uh, yeah, and uh, bringing in uh, foreign direct investment. Um, if we can just follow up on that, the you know it's it's so interesting the the your call for a, a united African strategy because the, you know I've heard that call a lot like I've I've heard it through all of the years that I've that I've been covering China Africa issues I've like you know kind of added my voice to that I've I've also advised in many cases that, you know Africa needs a united strategy to deal with China. Why do you think Africa doesn't have a united strategy yet? Like, you know, the, 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 the relationship as we see it now, you know, the, the modern contemporary China-Africa relationship is more than, is, is well past 20 years old. Like, why, why, what do you think is holding back a united African strategy on China? Uh, to me, it's a very complex question. First, we have very strong leaders uh, relying mostly on their intuitions in designing and implementing policies. Uh, than uh, on uh, 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 evidences, scientific evidences. So you can see how policies 
uh, are being designed and implemented in Africa. Uh, one head of state just make a decision, uh, some very often from scratch, I mean, based on literally no scientific evidences because uh, it's, it was just it's his own or her own inspiration, okay? So this is, uh, 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 I mean, the biggest issue. Uh, 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 very strong leaders uh, seeking literally uh, no insight uh, from uh, any segments of the society. So this is one. And uh, another related factor is uh, a very weak relationship between, for example, academia, research, and policy making. Okay? And as you can understand, easily understand, given the uh, increasingly complex, uh, uh, the, the increasing complexity of the world, uh, policy needs to be backed by strong uh, scientific uh, evidences. And this link is very weak. And uh, what you observe in, Af in Africa is that you have very strong leaders uh, just uh, uh, relying on their own intuition and inspiration uh, to lead policies. And uh, yeah, so this is the, 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 the result, uh, very uh, weak, uh, if any, uh, strategies uh, to, to pilot the economy or to deal with other countries and leaders. I wasn't sure if you were talking about your president or my president. <laughs> that, that actually seems to you were describing exactly how policy is made in the United States now, which is basically by instinct and gut and Twitter and not using scientific research and using policy making and think tanks like Brookings and whatnot. So interesting how the world is kind of coming together. But I, before we go, I just want to take advantage of the fact that you were in Washington. We talked a lot about the, the relationship with France. Uh, it turns out that France is no longer one of Senegal's top trading partners anymore. It's not even in the top 10 on imports and exports. Uh, but the United States is. And I'm curious to get your reflections on on U.S.-Africa relations and, you know, in general and from your time in Washington. Uh, Prosper Africa came out with a lot of fanfare uh, earlier this year. We haven't really seen much, but there is a new International Development Finance Corporation. Can you share with us a little, a few of your observations about, are the Americans uh, engaged in Senegal uh, the way that the Chinese seem to be coming in, or are the Americans kind of MIA? What, what are you seeing in terms of the United States? Look, this is a very interesting case. Most uh, developed countries in Europe and in the U.S. alike uh, tended to just consider Francophone Africa uh, uh, as a French influence zone. So uh, they usually tended to go through France to do anything in Francophone Africa. So what I observe is that uh, this is, is fast changing now due to mainly two factors. One factor is a uh, Chinese influence in Africa. And uh, this is making uh, countries like the US realize that they can no longer just rely on France uh, to deal with Francophone Africa and Africa in general. This is one. Number two is the jihadist threat. Uh, the world, the international community is now realizing that uh, the jihadist movement uh, uh, tend to use Africa uh, as their as their as their uh, normal base uh, to spread and develop capabilities uh, just to better harm them. So yeah, because of the uh, conjunction of these two factors, uh, I mean the development of the jihadist movement and the uh, rise in Chinese influence in Africa, uh, countries like the US uh, tend to uh, bypass France in uh, dealing with Africa, and they tend now to increasingly engage uh, with Africa without go going through France, which is, which is a, good, uh, uh, a good thing for, uh, uh, from my perspective. I think it's very good that America and other countries are directly dealing with Francophone African countries without going through France. 
because France has a lot of vested interests, but not only France. Uh, France Africa, as I mentioned earlier, is broader than France only. Uh, people just try to overlook the influence of some African leaders in this network. Uh, so I would qualify it uh, as, a, as a network of politicians and, and businessmen uh, uh, conspiring against France and Africa alike and uh, leaving uh, 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 France Africa relationship uh, as a, I mean, business in this area, uh, leaving this business as it used to be done previously, I think it, it's, it would be a very big mistake. And it's a very good uh, uh, news that America and other countries are now trying to fi- find their way through to Francophone Africa without going through France. Wow, that's it. these are exciting times with the Americans getting back engaged, as you say, obviously the Chinese, the Russians, the French weakening their hold a little bit and freeing up some of that energy that now can be placed elsewhere. Uh, Professor Amadou Ali Mbai is a non-resident senior fellow at the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C., and also a professor of economics at the University of Czech Antal Diop in Dakar. Thank you so much, Ali, for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. This is such an important conversation to have about Senegal and the relationship with China. We're looking forward to coming back to you in a few months as we move closer to FOCAC uh, coming up in 2021. Cobus and I will be there, so we're very, very excited that we're going to be there. I just invited you, Cobus, to go to FOCAC, so we're on our way to Dakar. (laughs) I'm very excited. Uh, But I hear Dakar is absolutely beautiful, so it's a good excuse to go to a beautiful part of the world. So, uh, so, but thank you so much, Ali, for taking the time to join us. We, we look forward to seeing you in Dakar. Sure, and thank you for having me. Look forward to welcoming you in Dakar. Kobus, we hear this over and over and over again from various African stakeholders who say that while the Chinese are now starting to evolve country-specific strategies in each part of Africa, and now the Chinese have arrived in West Africa into the Francophone zone, and it's clear that they are developing a strategy. To hear Ali say that Senegal lacks a strategy for China or a one belt, one road strategy, to me is just, it's shocking, to be honest with you. We are almost seven years into the one belt, one road. How is it possible that the government can't hire somebody to come and help them build a strategy? You know, an international consulting firm, they can hire SIA, they can hire who, I don't know, they can hire me. <laughs> but somebody, anybody, to come up with an idea of what to do and how to engage the Chinese. And this is what, to me, brings us back to the conversation that we had many months ago with uh, Fola Shade Sule, who is the guest that we had on the show and the expert from Oxford University on African-Chinese negotiations that if you don't understand who's sitting across the table from you, you're going to get your hat taken from you in the talks. It's almost guaranteed. So I don't know. I'm not left with an enormous amount of optimism that Senegal is truly ready to engage the Chinese now that the Chinese have finally set their sights on Dakar. Yeah, I mean, you know, the African Union uh, about from about two years ago uh, suggested um, that that they take a more of a leading role, you know, kind of an essentially um, instead of of Africa always being locked into bilateral relationships with China, where where the country, an African country, is by definition so much weaker than China, that that the African Union should be more more instrumental um, in pushing a, a collective African agenda, but. Then the question becomes, and that is, I think, what what ended up, you know, kind of making, like, kind of hamstringing that suggestion, was what does an, a collective African agenda look like, especially when different African states have very different stakes that they are pushing, um, and that there's actually very little, uh, you know, organically lived kind of, uh, you, you know, shared African identity on, on the ground. You know, Africa is a very big place, very, very divergent countries. Um, and so, so it, it, it naturally, or well, you know, it, it tends to break down into, you know, national leaders being, being obsessed by, by their own countries, um, rather than kind of moving to a larger level where they can actually all work together and work on finding synergies between different African countries and a collective agenda. That, is a, that has been a very difficult thing to achieve. Um, and yeah, you know, kind of I share, I share your dismay, you know, kind of this is, this is really, really overdue, but I, it's difficult to say how they're going to do it, yeah. Come on, get it together. 
I mean, there are a lot of China experts and China scholars and China you know, specialists who can work with various African governments to come up with a strategy. But to me, holding out for pan-Africanism, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think the Arab-Israeli peace process will come forward before that actually happens, in part because remember, with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, Nigeria was a holdout right until the end. Yes. Right? Yes. The big countries do not see their interests aligned with the small countries. It's the same problem we have in the United States, where me as a Californian feels an enormous amount of resentment towards somebody in Wyoming who they get two senators and I get two senators. How is it that a state with 600,000 people has the same power as a state with 40 million? Exactly. Compromise has to be made somewhere. Yes. And the big powers in Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Africa, have never really felt it in their interest to accommodate Togo. Yes, despite all of the rhetoric, right. you know, kind of uh, about how Africa should come together, it's very difficult for Africa to come together. Um, uh, yes, you know, kind of like the big, the big countries, the big countries don't want to lose control over their own relationship with China, you know, because they have a lot riding on it. You know, if you think about how, what proportion of, of Nigerian oil now goes to China. Um, and the small countries are frequently very, very leery of of being pushed out of these relationships by the bigger countries. Um, so you know, so so it's it's not even that the smaller countries are necessarily on on board for for collective negotiation either. They're also worried about kind of being sidelined sidelined by competitors within Africa. So for me, to to a certain extent, the question of what what Africa wants from China. Um, is preceded by a bigger and more more difficult question about what Africa wants, or more specifically, how Africa, sh like the, the kind of roadmap that Africa wants to implement on its way to to more prosperity. You know, so the African uh, African Union's agenda 2063 uh, is, uh, you know, is is a is a great, um, you know first step in that direction. It's, it does set up a kind of roadmap for general development, but it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, help much to, to, to work out these different questions about, like, you know, about how the countries are going to develop synergies to develop cross-border cooperation rather than competing for the same thing, you know, um, across the border with each other. But why do you keep coming back to the African Union? Because I'm not sure that the African Union is well-positioned to be an arbiter between the China-Africa relationship only because the African Union, the African Development Bank, uh, both have China as members. And then when we've seen uh, China get into a little bit of a spill with the African Union over the allegations, say, for example, of spying, uh, the African Union didn't say anything. They were very, very mum. They were very accommodating to the Chinese. So I'm not so sure that they would be actually a good you know, neutral arbiter between representing African states when in fact the Chinese have leverage over the AU, both because they're a member, but also because they're paying for the AU rapid reaction force. They paid for the building. I mean, there is leverage that comes with cash, right? There certainly, there certainly is leverage there. Imagine the AU trying to drive a hard bargain with the Chinese on behalf of their member states in Africa and the Chinese going, hey, buddy, really? I mean, like, so that's why I think, for example, it wouldn't necessarily be the AU or the AFDB, but it could be ECOWAS, it could be SADC, it could be the regional groupings where China is not a member. And the gap between the states and cultures and divergence and diversity that they have in, you know, in all the different ways that Africa is so diverse is minimized a little bit, at least by language and culture and region. So it seems like maybe ECOWAS could step up into this role a little bit more, for example. Yes, we, we definitely need to, you know, it would be very good for us on, on future podcasts to, to, to speak with ECOWAS or SADC experts about, you know, about how that would work, um, particularly in those, in those voting I blocks. keep inviting them and they will not come on the show. <laughs> I've invited AFDB. I've invited a I've been going back and forth now with the African Union for literally nine months. And they just woke. So if anybody who works at one of these groups would please, you know, take my email and respond and come back to us, we would love to have you on the show. I think I think you just you just identified the core problem right there. <laughs> oh man, that that was a fascinating talk because we have not focused on French speaking West Africa enough. Uh, we have not focused enough on uh, Arabic-speaking Africa, and it's been a long time since we've done something on Lusophone Africa. So we are really going to make a concerted effort in the next, uh, well, going forward to do more on this. And these are also topics that we're bringing up on our website, 
Uh, for those of you who are now subscribers to the China Africa Project, the numbers are going up. We're very, very grateful. Uh, you have access to everything that we're doing on the China Africa Project. Uh, for those of you who are not subscribers, you can still check some things out. Our podcasts are, are available. Our student exchange is available. And you get three or four pages a month that you can look at some of the stories that we're producing uh, Cobus, we did some really interesting stories over the past couple weeks, uh, talking about John Magafuli in uh, Tanzania and the deal that he's trying to trying to push now with China over the Bagamayo port. Uh, I wrote a, a, a an article that got quite a bit of circulation. How uh, I think that people should look to what Mohammed Mahathir did in Malaysia for some guidance as to maybe the game that Magafuli's playing with the Chinese and how he's negotiating. Really hard, really tough. But don't necessarily misunderstand tough negotiation for any break in the loyalty that Magafuli has with Beijing. That's one of the articles we talked about. Uh, let's see, what else did we... Oh, today we're talking about Xinjiang. And boy, oh boy, how Africa is just trying to keep its heads down from the, the fight that's going on at the United Nations right now between the U.S., the U.K., and a group of Western countries and China and 54 signatories to a letter that the Chinese are putting out. African countries are siding with the Chinese, but we talk a little bit about why. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we've got on our website that we're doing in our newsletter. And uh, and, and really, this is, this is pretty hardcore stuff, Kobus. I mean, this is for the China Africa follower who kind of does this for a living. And so more and more, our newsletter is actually being consumed by think tank people, government folks. We have investment and finance people. So if you do this for a living and you need to follow the minute by minute, the day by day type of coverage, then this newsletter is for you. If you're just listening to the podcast, then you're good. You don't need to, or to worry about it. Uh, you know, probably once a week will be more than enough. But uh, we want to invite you to subscribe and to be able to uh, to subscribe over at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Okay, Kobus, next week you're going to be writing as well. So yes. we're looking forward to seeing some of the the, uh, the articles that you'll be writing. And Kobus also in our newsletter, our daily newsletter, has been writing quite a bit of the introductions. And so we get a lot of Kobus's take on the world as well. So again, that's it for our newsletter and for our website. We will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. If you would like to reach out to Kobus or to me directly, uh, you can email us, eric at chinaafricaproject.com or Kobus at chinaafricaproject.com. Until next week, for Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. Mm-hmm.